that data is in oh <laughs> we're recording um we believe that that data is absolutely integral every decision that's made about the environment whether it's to create a new nature reserve or to build a new supermarket so uh, some kind of local planning development um it all depends on accessible wildlife information and so by taking part in wildlife recording you can help ensure that these important decisions are based on the best and most up-to-date information and can deliver the best results or avoid the worst results uh, for nature, in this case, mammals. Um, so it's all about helping to get better outcomes for nature. And the Mammal Society and other conservation organisations use that data all the time. We use it to inform local action, um, to inform ecological consultancies that are looking on whether or not, uh, you know, a planning um uh, a planned development is appropriate or whether it's going to have too much of an impact on on our fragile ecosystems and um, we use it to inform conservation priorities so it might be our own activities or what we're calling out for more of from other uh, others in the sector or from the government um, and it can inform policy so for example the state of nature report uh, which many of you may have seen the headlines around some of you may have read um, is looking at actually you know, what is uh, the state of uh, our wildlife and our ecosystems um, at the moment? And what does that mean? What do we need to do about it? And why is it an issue? Um, so when you submit a record via Mammal Mapper or through any of our other um, uh, survey specific ways of recording what you see, um, we don't just keep it to ourselves. We, we will serve that data um, for our own reports and feed it back to those that have been involved in the survey. Um, but we'll also put all records through something called iRecord. And iRecord, you may have heard of, it's, um, it's a really important um, network of ecologists um, and it's a database uh, that there's, they maintain and verify um, in order to get a really clear and accurate picture of um, biodiversity in the UK. Um, and so by feeding all of the records through iRecord, we ensure that they get passed by somebody who will look at them and decide whether or not it's correct identification and whether it's a verified record that can then um, add to the national picture um, of our ecosystems. And then verified records are also passed on to what's called the NBN Atlas, that's the National Biodiversity uh, Network, um, and they maintain um, an atlas that is fueled by uh, data from all sorts of places, including iRecord. Um, and so you can go onto the NBN Atlas and you can look up your postcode or your, your university uh, address and you'll be able to see um, what's judged to be um, in your local ecosystem. Um, and it's really important that that data is available uh, to everyone um, so that they can make those better decisions. So why universities? So we're here specifically to talk about what you can do um, on your campus. Um, and there's two reasons, really. One is that there's great people and the other is that they're great sites. Um, so getting an accurate picture of mammal populations um, for all the reasons that I've been through, it needs people power. It needs lots of people to be doing some fairly time intensive things um, to actually ascertain whether uh, mammals are there, which mammals they are, um, whether they're having issues, whether they're um, doing really well, uh, and what role they're playing in that ecosystem. Um, so people who can spend the time to get skilled up on those techniques for monitoring and recording, which I'm going to go through shortly, um, get to know their local ecosystem, and also the particular species or issues uh, that it might be important to monitor. Um, and also, really valuable, is where people can conduct long-term, consistent monitoring of the same sites to build up an accurate picture of trends, as well as just a snapshot of what's there at, at one particular time, because it does change. Um, so that means we need access to sites across all areas of the UK to build up a really accurate national picture. Um, and as many of you will know, um, only 8% of England is actually publicly accessible. Um, uh, it's a different uh, situation in Scotland, where there's a right to roam. So even if you um, uh, are a private landowner, uh, people can cross your land uh, and um, and as part of that would be able to monitor um, the, the biodiversity that they can see there, as long as they're not invading your privacy or interfering with any business activities you might have. Um, but here in England, there is a lot of landscape that people just can't access. Um, and so where we can have access to to landscape and it's just it's not just in nature reserves, which are not representative um, of uh, of the whole landscape. Um, 
that's really, really valuable. And of course, there are quite large university campuses all around the country. Um, they're often um, quite uh, diverse in terms of the different kinds of, of habitats that might be part of them. There's lots of potential for them to be improved in terms of their biodiversity value. Um, and uh, it's relatively straightforward um, if the decision is made uh, to make those improvements um, for that to be actioned because it's just it's managed by a particular institution um, and a particular land manager. Uh, so huge amounts of potential and monitoring of mammal presence in these sites can contribute hugely to biodiversity records. They give an indication of what's there in that whole area, not just on that particular site. Um, and at the same time, it's equipping the university community itself to consider improvements to the management of the site or projects to support existing and potential wildlife. Um, and for us, there's also huge benefit, as I mentioned at the beginning, in engaging uh, students um, and staff. Um, but while they're able to come together around such campus projects uh, and the benefits of training and experience that they gain, monitoring mammals on campus can be taken forward so that there are mammal monitoring champions for the future wherever they may end up living, working or visiting. So hopefully I've made a case there <laughs> for why uh, we uh, should be talking about this um, and why it's a real opportunity um, for all of you and for us um, to connect with universities. Um, and those of you that are already hedgehog friendly campuses will be doing you know, a lot of, of what I've just mentioned in specific to, to hedgehogs already. Um, and, that's, and that's hugely valuable and you'll already hopefully see uh, the benefits of doing that. But I'm going to run through a few of uh, the ways that you can actually monitor mammals on campus and what you might need to get started doing that. Uh, and hopefully this will spark off some ideas uh, for what your next steps might be. So the first is um, tracks and signs. So for all the reasons we've already outlined, you might not be able to just walk out uh, of, your, of your lecture um, and see one of the mammals that lives in your local landscape just running across the path in front of you. They are uh, elusive, they stay away from humans, they'll be in the wilder areas which are less well trod, um, and they are often only coming out at, um, from dusk till dawn. But they do leave tracks and signs behind them. Um, and the Mammal Society uh, really would like more people to feel that they can recognize those tracks and signs and we'll be running training courses around the country by CyberTrack qualified trainers. CyberTrack is a relatively new qualification that really assesses whether someone is an expert um, in, in uh, recognizing animal tracks and not just recognizing what tracks they are, um, but actually uh, interpreting lots of information about them. So um, from the age of the animal to the specific species when there's, when there's a number that are very similar um, to whether or not um, it's uh, male or female and so on. Um, and we can arrange those trainings specifically for a university if there's enough demand, particularly um, if uh, numbers are lower, but the university can host a training uh, and we can offer um, places and, and sell tickets uh, to others in the uh, surrounding area or bring in one of our local groups to benefit from the training at the same time. We're really open to discussing uh, what might be possible to get those skills out there. Um, and it's not just tracks, it's also what the mammals leave behind. So you might uh, you might not see the mammal itself, but you might see some scat, some poo, um, and uh, wonder what on earth left that. And actually, um, if you know your stuff, um, you can tell what mammal is there, maybe even um, what it's been eating and all sorts of things about it. Um, so loads of potential there. The second, um, which the hedgehog friendly campus will probably uh, be very familiar with is footprint tunnels. These are sometimes called hedgehog tunnels because they're particularly suitable uh, for uh, monitoring if you have hedgehogs and how many and what ages they might be and so on. But actually all mammals um, that uh, can fit through a tunnel um, can be tracked in this way. Um, and uh, it's a really straightforward, um, very cheap bit of kit. You can make one yourself or, or we can um, loan them. Um, or you can uh, purchase them from um, a number of different places linked from our website. It's, um, as you can see, incredibly straightforward. Um, you make a, a sort of pyramidal um, tunnel uh, out of something that's not going to get too soggy if it rains. Um, and inside you have um, an ink trap, um, which is just, it's not normally ink, it's normally charcoal dust, as you can see in uh, that little jar there mixed with a little bit of oil just so that it's um, it's going to, uh, to, to stay there. 
Um, you spread two patches of that, and then in between them, you put some bait. And then at either end of the tunnel, you have some nice clean white bits of paper or card um, that capture the footprints that the animals then leave as they're exiting, whichever way they go. Um, so you get nice clear prints um, and you can have a look and see um, if it's what you expected or if it's things you didn't expect. And of course, you can bait it with a variety of things. So if it's hedgehogs that you're specifically um, checking for or if you think you might have, um, you'd probably put some pet food in the middle there, um, some cat or dog food. Um, but you can also put some grains or some berries or some fruits uh, and that will attract um, some of the smaller mammals uh, that wouldn't want the meat um, but they might still be um, running around looking for things. Um, you can get much smaller footprint tunnels as well specifically for small mammals um, so that they're uh, you know uh, you can tuck them right in to the long grass areas where they might be scurrying around and put some grain in them um, and these are very low risk um, if you forget about them and don't come back for a week uh, you're not going to have caused any harm because animals just walk through. The bait will have gone, um, but uh, that's uh, still not causing any problems for anything that went through. Um, and as you'll see, uh, there's um, really accessible guides. So you don't have to be able to pull out that piece of paper and go, oh, I know what that is. Um, you can ref reference um, our uh, guide that we've made with, um, with the Field Studies Council. Um, it's uh, only about three pounds um, on their website, linked from our website as well. Um, and that gives really detailed notes on exactly what each footprint looks like for the mammals you're likely to see. Um, and you can kind of have a real um, assessment of what you've what you've uh, picked up there. So footprint tunnels are great and um, we'd really like uh, there to be more use of them. Um, because you can, as I said, have them out there with, with very little risk. You can have quite a few around different parts of the campus, um, which is useful not only because you'll get more data and um, because you'll have more opportunities for the mammals to visit them, but also you might get a better assessment of actually where in the campus uh, the, the mammals are, are most um, frequently foraging and so on. Um, so really, really useful data and Mammal Mapper um, we want those records, um, even though that's not a nice picture of a hair bouncing past you, um, a picture of, uh, of a track is something that can still be verified uh, by one of our ecologists. So the other way, which I think a lot of people jump straight to when they're thinking about small mammals, um, is live trapping. Um, and so generally speaking, we say there are better options. There are uh, options um, like the ones that I've already mentioned and some others that I'll come to that mean that you're not having to interfere with the lives of uh, these little critters. However, the footprints and, and the droppings can be very, very difficult to tell apart between the, the smallest mammals, particularly between the individual species of, so for example, vole or shrew. Um, and we wouldn't expect, uh, you know, unless you are um, a cyber track uh, qualified master tracker, uh, that you'd actually be able to tell even if you did manage to pick up some discernible footprints. So live trapping is sometimes um, a useful way to be able to check exactly what you've got and, and maybe to see how they're doing. Uh, and it's it is nice to be able to sometimes see uh, the animal itself uh, and to just remind yourself that um, they are um, wonderful and cute little creatures. Um, so what we'd say around this is um, don't do it unless you're confident and uh, you are going to do it in a way that you are uh, sure is, um, is responsible and ethical. Uh, so we have a publication that you can see there on the slide, Live Trapping Small Mammals, um, which gives all of the principles um, as well as the techniques so that you know that you're doing it in a way that's not going to cause any harm. Um, but if you do, if you go in um, knowing the risks and, and doing it responsibly, um, it is uh, relatively easy. Um, what you can see on the screen there is called a Longworth trap, which are the ones that we recommend. Um, and as you can see, there's a kind of tunnel component and then a box. And in the box, you can put um, a bit of bedding as well as a bit of suitable bait. You can make it comfortable in there. Um, and if something comes through the tunnel, that activates the door, which closes, and then they're trapped in there. Um, and if you don't leave it very long, that's absolutely fine. But you do have to know that you're going to be able to get back to that trap after a few hours. So if you leave it in the evening, you're going to go back first thing in the morning. Um, if you're suspecting that you've got uh, shrews, um, which are uh, a focus for us at the moment, um, and they're very common, 
um, you have to be extra careful about how long you leave it for and make sure you leave plenty of food and bedding um, because they have to eat constantly. And if they don't, uh, they can have a real problem. And, and shrews are insectivorous, so it's not as easy as just putting a pile of grain, um, which will keep them going for a while. Um, you need to put stuff in there that, that will keep them uh, keep them going, keep them comfortable. Um, but even if you've put enough food and bedding in there, you don't want to leave them very long in there because they'll get stressed and upset. And sometimes that can be enough to um, to, to finish them off. Um, but if you do this responsibly, you do it maybe for a specific amount of time with a particular objective in mind. Um, it means that as well as getting a real clear picture of what you've got, um, you get to meet them, which is quite nice. And we would definitely want to give some advice and support and we can loan traps um, to universities that want to do this um, so that we can make sure you're confident that you're doing it in the right way. So next of all uh, is camera traps. Uh, so camera traps are not that cheap, um, but when you've got one, um, you can use it a lot and lot in lots of different ways. Um, and they are a great way of getting a kind of best, uh, kind of a nice compromise between um, not being able to see the mammal in the flesh, but being able to to see what it's actually doing and what you've what you've actually got. Um, so this one's set up uh, to monitor, you know, um, potential um, uh, badger track. So it's low down, it's out there in a woodland area um, attached to a tree. Um, and that's one way that you can use it um, is just to see what's what's going along um, uh, the, the kind of tracks or through the hedge um, gaps that you see on, on the campus. Um, and you can get some really nice uh, pictures. So it'll activate whenever anything comes through. Um, if it's a windy day, that means you've got millions of videos of, of just waving branches to look at, but um, on, on a still day, um, you, you can get some really good insights in, into what's visiting. Um, but there are more innovative ways that you can use it. Um, so you can set up exactly the same camera trap um, and just basically fix it to the back of a box. Um, and that could be a box that's suitable for nesting, or it could just be a box where you put a bit of, of, of bait, seeds or, or um, uh, mealworms or whatever it might be. Um, and then when the small mammals come to visit, um, you'll be able to pick those up as well, because sometimes they'll be amongst the leaf litter and they won't be picked up by uh, a camera that's just uh, looking at a wide area of woodland floor. Uh, so camera traps are great. Um, and again, it's something which if, if you're interested in getting that initial insight into what might be visiting um, and you don't have a camera trap of your own, um, there are places uh, to uh, to loan them from, including the Mammal Society, um, and we would love to help you to do that. Um, in some cases, surveys particularly benefit from camera traps um, because if you have enough of them out in a particular area, you don't just get um, evidence of presence. You also get a sense of the density of population. So we're currently looking at doing um, a uh, an England, uh, potentially UK wide survey to look at uh, the density of population of foxes. Because um, at the moment, we just have a range map, which is the whole of the UK, which isn't very helpful. Um, and actually, lots of decisions are made that affect foxes. Um, and it's not they're not particularly well informed at the moment. Um, and so this is an example of the kind of thing where, um, you know, having access to all areas of a university campus and being able to put up, you know, maybe 10 traps around um, a, a relatively small area of the landscape we really would be able to get some good insight into um, just how many foxes there are, how many different individuals, and so on. Uh, okay, I can't reach my, uh, there we go. I hope no one's been just watching, uh, this meeting is being recorded, sign in the middle of my screen, I'm just gonna. Okay, so the next one is um, audio. Um, so you're probably familiar with the concept of using a, a bat monitor. Uh, so this is a bat box duet, but there are lots of different kinds of, of bat monitoring device. Um, and they range from you know, pretty affordable up to very, very uh, complex um, and the kind that would be used by ecological consultants that need um, lots and lots of data on uh, which bats and, and what they're doing and so on. You can even get ones that just plug into your smartphone and you use them through an app, which makes them even more affordable. Um, so um, bat detection is great just to find out which bats you've got uh, that might be roosting or, or hunting uh, in the campus. Um, but also uh, there's actually other things that could be picked up by audio monitoring as well. And that little insert picture in the circle um, is called an audio moth. Um, and they're 
uh, really simple little circuit boards that are set up just to do one thing, which is just record what's happening around them. So they're a bit like a bit of spy spy equipment. Um, but they're they're really useful for getting insight into all of the things that are happening um, at night when a lot of the wildlife starts to become active. Um, and so, yes, it will pick up uh, the, the back calls that you can then analyze through any software that's designed to look at audio and, and identify which bat it is, because they all uh, use their um, echolo echolocation skills at different frequencies, so you can tell which is which. Um, but also you might pick up small mammals and you might pick up foxes, and of course you might pick up bird life as well. Um, so uh, you can actually get a lot of insight from um, from audio, um, and it's a really interesting project uh, if someone's interested um, in in doing that over a, over a short period of time or over a more sustained period of time. Um, so the uh, the uh, the downside of it is, of course, that um, if you just listen to the audio, uh, it can take a very long time, and you don't get uh, you won't necessarily know what you're listening to. Um, so the key thing is being able to analyze it through specialist software, which is getting better and better all the time. Um, but by taking part in a project uh, like the, the Bat Conservation Trust's Nightwatch, um, or uh, there are various um, sort of university-led um, uh, or PhD research projects that are, are looking into this kind of technology at the moment, um, by collecting that data and then providing it to those projects, you won't just get the results that, that can give you some insight into what's happening, um, but you're also helping uh, those projects to build up a better database um, and, and lots of, um, uh, they, they can basically train um, AI software um, that will uh, be able to, to do a better and better job of analyzing um, so that hopefully in the future we'll all have really um, straightforward uh, ways to just um, plug what we get from audio devices in and just find out exactly what's there. At the moment, it's a bit of a manual task, but um, it is interesting. And then finally, um, something that the Mammal Society is currently uh, really pushing is owl pellet dissection. Um, and this feeds into everything that I've said really about uh, the elusiveness of um, some of our most important mammals, which are, which are our small mammals. Um, where we don't necessarily have any way of, of spotting them or seeing them, and it might be over very large landscapes, um, might not know where to put traps. Not picking one up in a trap isn't evidence that, that you don't have one, um, and same with, uh, with camera traps. Um, however, while we might struggle to spot these elusive small mammals, um, owls are extremely good at it. Um, they're silent hunters um, and with incredible night vision, um, and so they're picking up whatever small mammals are there and they hunt uh, prolifically, particularly when they're uh, they're feeding um, chicks back in the nest as well as themselves. And so if you have access to barn owl pellets um, from uh, any nearby site, you can analyze uh, pellets from other owls or other birds of prey as well. Um, however, barn owl pellets are particularly good because they have very weak stomach acid. So when they hack up a pellet, uh, which um, all birds of prey do uh, when they've swallowed their prey whole and they've digested all the meat off the of the bones and everything. Um, the bones get wrapped up in fur inside them and then they regurgitate it. And so it looks like a poo, but it's actually not not been that far through the body of the creature. Um, so it's um, relatively uh, it's not particularly unpleasant. Um, but what happens is you crack it open and you will find the remains of whatever meal it did have, um, including, of course, uh, the bones of those small mammals. Um, so we're helping um, volunteers all around the country to access owl pellets, either from their local area um, or just generally from sites where we have owl pellets, but we don't have people uh, ready to dissect them, um, because the data from these owl pellets gives us really amazing insight into what small mammals are, are in those areas and also what small mammals are not in there. Because um, if you if you analyze you know twenty or thirty pellets from a certain site um, and there are no uh, common voles, um, it's it's likely there are no common voles in that site. Because if there were, owls would have caught them. Um, and with some of the rarer species, that might be less of a of a conclusion that you can draw. But you can certainly say they're not prolific. Um, but the most important thing um, for us at the moment is that by analyzing these owl pellets, uh, we're able to uh, to see if um, there is the presence of a particular invasive or potentially invasive species that we've currently got 
making its way around the country. Um, it's a, a kind of shrew that shouldn't be here. It's called the Greater White Tooth Shrew. Um, and uh, it has um, a very uh, noticeable feature. So if you have its skull, um, you'll be able to look at it and see whether or not uh, it has um, red tipped teeth. And if it does have red tipped teeth, you don't have to worry because all of our native shrew species have red tipped teeth. Um, that's uh, basically deposits of iron in the enamel that give them a nice strong um, teeth for crunching all those insects. Um, but if it doesn't have red tips, it could be a greater white tooth shrew, which shouldn't be here, um, but it, it has definitely come over here because a few have been found in a couple of counties, um, Cambridgeshire and Nottinghamshire so far. Um, but we have no idea how widespread it is. We have no idea how, um, how many there are. And where we do know it is, um, where we do know there are great white tooth shrew, we haven't yet um, been able to monitor the impact that's having on uh, the populations of other species. Um, so in Ireland, um, where the greater white tooth shrew has, has really um, taken over ecosystems, uh, it's pretty much wiped out pygmy shrews. And pygmy shrews are one of our um, uh, most common species. They're, they're really, really important in ecosystems. Um, and, uh, and they're very cute. And uh, although they're very small, they're our smallest mammal. Um, they're actually one of the ones that you might see scurrying around underfoot if you're out uh, at sort of dusk um, in somewhere with long grass. Um, but a greater white tooth shrew, they're a bit bigger. Uh, they outcompete them, they bully them. Um, and uh, in Ireland, they have, have caused pygmy shrew to almost be completely lost. And we don't want that to happen here and, and the knock-on effects would be quite serious. So we're trying to monitor to see um, if that's happening or if our ecosystems are diverse enough that um, the introduction of that species has not um, been such a problem as it has been in Ireland. Um, and if we do find that it's um, you know something which needs managing, uh, that obviously informs us and allows us to maybe do something before it's too late. So if you're interested in our pellet dissection, we've got loads of resources um, to support that. These pages are from uh, a new book. Um, Actually, these are from uh, a book we've had for a while, but there's a there's a brand new spanking new guide, um, which is all photo led. So you can see exactly what you found in the owl pellet photographed. Um, so you know that you're seeing the right thing. Um, and what we want is not only um, notification if anyone finds that that uh, uh, invasive species, um, but just generally, what do you find? Because that's helping us build up a much clearer picture of small mammal ranges around the UK. And it's fun <laughs> and it's something which as well as uh, having fun doing yourself um you know it's something you can involve uh the wider community in um schools if you're interested in in reaching out and connecting to local schools it's something which um is a great educational activity uh for kids to do um and uh obviously you still get the data at the end of it um so you get kind of multiple benefits and then I wanted to say before I finish and, and ask for any questions um, that although there's loads of things, as you've heard, that you can do on your campus, um, you don't have to, to be restricted to your campus. Uh, we'd love to have the involvement of students and university communities in some of our surveys, um, which you can um, potentially uh, do on campus, depending on what habitats uh, you have. Um, but you can almost definitely find somewhere nearby uh, where um, you can get involved and, and really help us out. Uh, so the example that I'm giving here on this screen is the Harvest Mouse Survey. Uh, our National Harvest Mouse Survey is coming into its third uh, year um, of, of monitoring, um, and it runs from October to March. Um, and it doesn't involve what you see on the left there, which is um, you know picking up a, a really cute little harvest mouse. Um, it actually involves more of what you see on the right there, which is finding their nests. But this is at a time of year when the nests are no longer in use. Uh, so they use them over the summer um, to, to have their young, their kits, and then um, they just leave them. But they're these lovely little um, balls of woven grass, um, and they're quite distinct. You can tell them apart from other nests. There are um, other mammals that make nests a bit like this, um, for example, uh, the harvest dormouse. Um, but they do them in a different way. They don't weave living grass into these balls and they, they tend to just take strands of grass and weave them um, and put them up in trees or, or in the, the nooks of trees. Harvest mice, they're basically suspended halfway up the strands of grass in, in dense um, fields of long grass or sedge or, or reed beds. Um, and so if you kind of go from October to March um, and you basically just go swimming 
uh, through the long, uh, long stems, um, then if you spend long enough uh, in an area, you'll assess whether or not there are any harvest mice nests because because um, you, you will spot them if you come across them. Um, this is really important because harvest mice are a perfect example of a small mammal for which we don't have enough data and it would really, really help uh, to be able to have them. They're one of our sort of most loved uh, little critters. Um, they are... Um, uh, uh, the harvest mice, so they, they um, eat uh, grains and seeds, um, and they're very important prey um, for other species, um, but they have this lovely um, balancing effect in the ecosystem, um, and they themselves never cause any problems. They are just, um, uh, they maintain a nice um, population number when they're thriving, um, and they're just really lovely to have uh, on site. Um, so if you have any long grass reed beds near a, near a wetland area or, or a stream um, or uh, those kinds of field edges where you have long um, strands of, of uh, cereal crops, etc., cetera, um, it's worth doing a harvest mouse survey. But there might be other areas um, outside the university campus where you could go and help us out as harvest mouse volunteers. OK. So I'll mention now as well, um, uh, something we, we try and do every year. Um, it normally starts around November, but this year uh, it's likely that we'll, we'll be starting um, possibly after, after Christmas in the new year and working up to the spring. Um, but our University Mammal Challenge is a really fun way to get involved in some of this activity. Um, it's basically just a, a sort of a bit of competitiveness between uh, groups of students in different universities. Um, you get involved, you register, and you get out and do some of these monitoring activities, um, and you send us your results, and you let us know what activities you're doing, uh, and we keep a, a, a fun uh, log of um, a leaderboard, effectively, of, of how much activity is being done by different groups and how much they find, um, so you can be the, the champion university mammal monitoring team uh, for that year. Uh, so do look out for that. But also, if you are interested um, in just being kept uh, informed of when the next one kicks off, um, do send an email to uh, Fiona. I'm going to share her email address shortly. Um, and as we uh, put the plans in place, um, you will hear about it. Um, OK, that's it from me. So uh, I just wanted to mention um, membership. We have a student rate for membership of the Mammal Society. Um, so it's normally five pounds a month, but for a student, it's three pounds a month. Um, and uh, for that, uh, you get reduced pr price tickets on our range of training courses. Uh, we have a huge um, program of training courses, and it's going to involve some really useful introductory uh, courses over the next uh, over the next year. Um, and uh, basically, if you are if you are planning to go on any training courses, I would thoroughly recommend you sign up as a member of the Mammal Society because you will make your money back on your year's membership uh, very quickly. Um, you also get reduced price uh, attendance at our annual conference, which is a really great way to tap into everything that's happening um, for mammal conservation and science um, each year. Uh, the next one's in Cambridge uh, in April. Uh, you also get our, our members magazine as a PDF um, and you are a official member of the Mammal Society, which means that you are kept informed about our own priorities um, and actions and you can feed in to decisions at our annual general meeting um, and even join our committees. Uh, we have a science advisory committee, a fundraising committee, uh, a training and education committee and, and all of these uh, rely on, on people uh, bringing their time and expertise to support us in our work. Um, and you can go one step further and you can form a local mammal group. And I think uh, this is something which hopefully uh, you'll hear more about from, from us jointly with SOS um, on how uh, we might define a university specific model for a mammal group. But as you've gathered, we need those, those uh, boots on the ground um, looking out for mammals and knowing what to do when they see them uh, and see their signs and record them. Um, and uh, if you sign up as a local mammal group, there are various things that we can do to support you. Uh, we can cover uh, your activities with our insurance if they're, if they're not covered by the university's insurance. There's equipment that we can loan you and so on. So lots of things that we can do if you're part of our network of, of local groups. So that's it from me. I'm going to pass over back to, um, to Joe for, for any questions that might come from attendees. Um, and Fiona will be on hand as well um, to answer any questions or to take your details if you're interested in connecting with us. 
um, we'd love to support uh, whatever you want to do with your campus and with your community um, around our surveys. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Matt. That was brilliant. It was so interesting to hear about all of the different range of other opportunities that are, that students and staff at universities and colleges um, can kind of get involved in. There were just like a no end of, of, of opportunities for them to be doing mammal surveying and all of them really exciting. So that's great. I know we've got a lot of questions and there's been a lot of chat in the chat box there. So Bethany, I'm just going to pass over to you so we can make the most of the rest of our time um, and get through some of those, um, some of those nitty, nitty gritty questions in the chat box. Who have we got questions from? Where do we want to start? Awesome. Thanks, Joe. So our first question is from Sibby. For the survey tunnels, does leaving the tunnel out for five days in a row apply to all small mammals? Uh, so you can, I mean, you can leave it uh, just overnight and see what you get. But obviously, um, it might be that, that that you don't get anything in a particular night. And that's not a sign that there isn't anything around. It might just be the weather conditions or, or the fact that uh, the the mammal had a re the mammals that you've got locally had a reason to stay a little bit um, subdued that night. Um, so it's a good idea to leave it out for yeah a few days, um, whether it's small or, or the larger footprint tunnels. Um, but it is also worth checking it daily because um, it can be really frustrating if you go after five days and there was just you know a, a downpour on the last day and uh, the the papers got soggy and and you can't read the footprints anymore. But you you can see there were some and you've missed out on them because you left it for too long. Uh, so what we're suggesting um, is doing it as a kind of spot check maybe every uh, season um, so leaving it out for a week but checking it daily during that week and you can always then change the paper uh, refresh the um uh, the the charcoal patches uh, and just keep it running in that way awesome thanks Matt just another one from Sibi as well um for the camera surveys have you got any tips to try and capture smaller species on camera? Because most of the time they are bouncing around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so the the only real advice I can give you there is, is what I said earlier, which is by positioning them uh, at the back of a box. Uh, so you kind of, or even a tunnel, um, so that you kind of force them to to come in and, uh, and be in a particular place. Um, because otherwise, yeah, it can be very tricky um, and uh, to actually see what they were. Um, particularly if it's night vision um, footage that you've got uh, and it's not even in colour. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's the best thing to do. It's, it's worth experimenting um, and and seeing if you can, you know, come up with a model that doesn't um, stop the camera from, um, from having nice clear footage, um, but it does kind of bring the small mammals in close enough that you get that clear, clear um, picture. Thanks. Fiona's actually answered all the other questions in the chat. So if anyone has any of those, feel Thanks, free Fiona. to speak now. <laughs> Do you want to come on and just uh, say hi as well, Fiona, just because I, I spoke for you. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. So um, I'm Fiona. I'm the Education and Training Officer at the Mammal Society. This is only about my third or fourth week. So I'm still kind of getting my head around everything. But university um, engagement is something that we're really looking to kind of push this year and we're really excited to get the mammal challenge started again so yeah if there's anything that we've talked about that you want to get involved with or anything you know, you've got an idea and you think we could be part of or we could help feel free to drop me an email i'll pop my email in the chat box now as well thank you if you have um uh, some enthusiasm from you know one or two people in in a university uh and you'd love to be doing more on campus and beyond um but there just isn't doesn't seem to be a way that you can get momentum going with your university uh still please do like look at our local groups network and consider just getting involved with your local group um and and obviously if there's anything that that can be done on campus um but you don't have uh, enough um uh, support from the student body there um it could be that volunteers can come in and benefit from that amazing site um, and, and just by facilitating access for people who can do that monitoring, you can gain that insight and you can also be supporting us um, to, to, to get some really good data. Very good point, Matt. Yeah, we, we, we have to remember for those of us that are hedgehog friendly um, volunteers, it's not just about hedgehogs. Um, I, I had a question if nobody else did um, just before we, we wrap up, Matt, if that's OK. And this is around the live trapping 
um uh slide and that and that the sort of context that you gave us for that um are there any rules or kind of maybe laws or anything around live trapping that people volunteers might need to be aware of or is it just a case of kind of reading through that guide and once you kind of roughly know what you're doing and you're feeling confident you can you can kind of get out and do it or do they need to, do people need to be aware of, kind of what you can and can't do yeah no that's a I'm glad you asked that because yeah it's not quite as simple as just some generic good principles so that guides uh you know a really good way to just make sure that you're doing it responsibly uh, and in the right way um, but also, as you said, there are some laws. So, um, for example, um, if you catch an invasive species in your trap, um, you are actually not allowed to release it again. So you, you're then in a, a difficult position of having to do something <laughs> with what you've caught. Uh, so you have to you have to consider your responsibilities there. There's also some for whom it is um, you need to be, have a special license to trap and um, handle. Um, so of course it's it's possible you're not going to get into trouble if you had no reason to think it was there you put a longworth trap down to, to see what kind of vole you've got and you accidentally caught something which you're not allowed to uh to handle you should should have under license you just let it go straight away and you don't put a trap back down um so you know the it, the, the law is kind of reasonable in that regard um but yeah you do need to know where you stand on it and if you were to catch for example a great white tooth through we'd obviously be very very keen to know um that's that's absolutely vital data and actually um if you let us know someone would probably be able to help you out and, and come and pick up uh the the species um uh, while they're still running around in a little cage um but uh yeah you can't release it back out so you've kind of created a little issue for yourself and it's not just uh the greater white tooth shrew there's various others um that are species that we know they're out there um but they are they're classed as an invasive and uh, it's actually illegal to to be releasing them so thank you for highlighting that because it's worth people being aware of that that's often what puts people off using the traps it's not the um it's not concern about doing it you know uh in a way that's going to cause distress to the animal it's that possibility that they might find themselves having to you know um keep something in a, in a cage they didn't want didn't want a pet um, and in fact you, you you're not meant to to even do that with some of them um or, or actually you know cull it or hand it over to someone that will cull it and that's not a very nice thing for a nature lover to, to do thanks for that matt bethany if you had any more questions come through on the chat box in the meantime Nope, you've covered everything. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Oh, amazing. Well, thanks, um, Fiona, for keeping up on the chat as well, because I know we had quite a few questions come through there. So, um, but yeah, it was, it was, that was a really, really interesting talk. I'm glad we were able to kick off our conference series with that and hopefully inspire some of the um, staff and students that we work with or that we don't currently work with to be doing um, perhaps more around mammal monitoring. And um, hopefully through that, you, um, you kind of got the gist that there's lots of support and resources out there available to you whether that's through Matt and Fiona and the Mammal Society um, or whether that's through us so just as a reminder and I think Bethany you've popped in, into the chat box we do have um, things like tracking tunnels and we do have a small um, sort of bank of uh, um, wildlife cameras available as well and um, so there is there is resource out there for you um, but yeah, that was that was fantastic. Just a few little bits to wrap up before we let you all go off and have your lunch um, around hedgehog friendly. Um, so for anybody that isn't involved, just a few points for you here. So the Hedgehog Friendly Campus program is a big national awards program that we run here at SOS. Um, and it is all about making positive changes for wildlife on your campus, whether that's a, a school, college or a university. Um, and the year for Hedgehog, the Hedgehog Friendly Award has just begun again. So at the beginning of the academic year. So if you haven't already registered to take part in Hedgehog Friendly this year, there is still time. Um, and uh, please just go along to our website to find out a little bit more about that. Bethany will pop the link in the chat box for you. Um, so that's, that's just one quick reminder. A second one is that we currently have the big hog friendly litter pit challenge running. And um, that's kicked off. I think it was the end of September and it's running until the end of November. So for any um, universities or colleges that haven't signed up to take part in the litter pit challenge, please do. Um, we have a hedgehog house and hedgehog food available for the winners of each category. More information on our website there. Um, so please get on and register if you haven't already. Um, and then just the last thing to say in the last couple of minutes is that this is just the first of three uh, webinars for our conference series this year. We do have two more coming up in the next few weeks. We have one from our research team here at SOS 
which is about monitoring and evaluating your impact for the work that you're doing um, for Hedgehog Friendly, please do come along to that one because that's going to be really useful and very practical advice for you in, in kind of running your projects and programmes and doing all of the stuff that you're doing and measuring the impact for it. Please come along to that one. That's in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and we also have another one um, from the Pesticide Action Network, which we're really looking forward to, or Pan UK. Pan UK are coming along to talk a little bit about how you can minimise the impacts of pesticides on your campus um, and uh, learn a little bit more about the problems that wildlife faces from um, pesticides. So please come along to that one as well. Hopefully, Bethany, the information for those in the chat box. So go ahead and follow the links for those. We'll be sending some more information out through the newsletter and also on our social media channels, which I think you can get as at hog friendly across all of them. Um, so please do go ahead and have a look at all the opportunities that we've got coming up. Um, so that's it. We've done just about on time. And uh, just again, a final thank you, Matt and Fiona, for coming along and delivering what was a fantastic start to our Hedgehog Friendly Campus Conference series. Thank you ever so much.